programa Cesar Televisión a través de Canal de Gobierno y las distintas redes sociales de Cesar. Es un gusto para mí recibirlos hoy y poder recibir con nosotros a un invitado muy especial. Él es Roger Thoreau, él nos acompaña directamente desde Washington, D.C. Robert Thoreau es un miembro principal de la alimentación y agricultura mundial en el Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Fue periodista en el Wall Street Journal durante 30 años, 20 de ellos como corresponsal en el extranjero. Él es, junto con Scott Hillman, el autor de Enough, Why the World's Poorest Starving Age of Plenty, que ganó el premio libro Harry Chapin, Why Hunger, y fue finalista del Dayton Literary Peace Prize y de la New York Public Library, Helen Bernstein. Además, es el autor de The Last Hunger Season, A Year in an African Farm Community on the Brink of Change. Recibió el premio humanitario Action Against Hunger en 2009, y actualmente vive en Washington DC con su esposa. Vamos a darle la bienvenida al señor Roger Thurow. Welcome and thank you for being here. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So we're going to start directly with uh, the first question. What led you, what's your trajectory and what led you to write a book about the thousand day window? Good, thank you. Um, so I was a reporter with the Wall Street Journal uh, for 30 years. Uh, 20 of them as a foreign correspondent based mainly in, 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 in Europe and then also then in uh, South Africa. Uh, and so it was during that time of foreign uh, corresponding uh, that really started to write a lot about humanitarian and development issues uh, in, in Africa, Asia uh, mainly. Uh, and it was at that time uh, in uh, 2003, one of the really transformational points of that, and I think all my foreign corresponding led me to this point. Um, in 2003, there was uh, the first famine of the 21st century, the first famine of this great millennium of ours uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, there were 14 million, 14 million people that were on the doorstep of starvation. They were being kept alive if they were going to survive at all by international food aid that was coming uh, into the country. And so as a reporter for the Wall Street Journal writing about humanitarian and development issues, uh, I figured that's the place that I need to go and report on what's happening here. How have we brought hunger and malnutrition, this medieval suffering, into the 21st century and into this grand new millennium of ours with all the advances that we've had and all the scientific advancements in, in, in agriculture, in poverty reduction, uh, all the telecommunications possibilities literally at our fingertips that we can kind of communicate with people instantaneously anywhere in the world. How have we brought this medieval suffering of malnutrition and famine and hunger with us into the 21st century? So I went to Ethiopia, uh, the capital of Addis Ababa. My first day in Addis was meeting with uh, uh, workers with the World Food Program, uh, the, the UN organization, uh, Food Relief. And they were involved in, in, in distributing food aid to these 14 million people or so uh, that were in such desperate needs. And in talking, uh, kind of looking at a, at a map of Ethiopia and Africa, at the various hunger zones in Ethiopia and across the country, and across the continent of Africa, uh, because in, in, in the next couple of days I would be traveling with them to see their kind of operations to which the people impacted. One of the people in the World Food Program said, gave me a piece of advice, but to me it sounded like a, like a pretty ominous warning. And he said, Roger, looking into the eyes of someone dying of hunger becomes a disease of the soul. For what you see is that nobody should have to die of hunger, particularly not now in the 21st century. I like disease of the soul. What's this guy talking about? You know, you figure uh, you protect yourself as, against any physical ailments or disease. So the malaria medication, uh, you know, yellow fever uh, shots. Uh, you know, you're mindful of, of cholera or meningitis or something. But disease of the soul. What's that? The next day, then we were down in the hunger zones, and we were in one village where there were, were, were a number of, of, of big tents, like big army tents, uh, that were set up. And they were filled with dozens and dozens and dozens of starving children and their parents. So we kind of parted the flaps of one of the tents and went inside. And yeah, there were, were 50 or 60 uh, children and their parents uh, that were in there. I was almost speechless. I, I didn't know what to say. These, these children were in desperate shape. Some were being fed by, by you know, feeding tubes. Uh, they were so weak and, 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 and skeletal, um, in a sense. And I made, me, made my way to, to, to one of the, the, the parents, a father, who was a smallholder farmer. He had been kind of impacted by the weather, which, which had tipped them into famine. There were a lot of reasons, economic reasons and others, that were leading into that. And his little boy. And he had carried his, his son, uh, his name was Hargirso, 
from his house, uh, you know, many miles away, to this area where these emergency feeding tents were, doctors and nurses and development workers. His son was five years old and he weighed just 27 pounds uh, when he carried him into the, the, the tent. And those were the first eyes of, of the father Tesfaye and the son, Hardir so. The first eyes of starving that I really looked into. Uh, and after all my years of foreign corresponding, uh, I was kind of ashamed of myself that why hadn't I written about this issue before, or really focused on it. Maybe it was kind of the background of stories and things of reporting from Africa. And so that did, as the World Food Program person had mentioned, hearing their story and looking into their eyes, and their eyes of desperation uh, and, and, and abandonment of, of, of hope of, of the situation they were in, uh, that did in essence become my disease of the soul. Because as foreign correspondents, you, you go from place to place and story to story, uh, you, 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 you do your interviews or your observation, you write the story, then you leave and you go on to the next story. This is the one that stopped me cold. Uh, I knew as a foreign correspondent I needed to come back and come back and come back to this story because what the father was saying and what his eyes and kind of a desperate uh, message were, he was saying, what have I done to my son that he's in such shape? He's a farmer. He wasn't grown enough. He was a father. How was my son in such a desperate shape of malnourishment and hunger? And as I thought about it, that was the wrong question. It wasn't what had he done to his son, but what had we, we, a collective we as the world, done to his son? How do we allow this suffering to come into the 21st century, three years into this new millennium of ours? And so, before I finished speaking to them, I was then, the doctors and nurses were there. And they said, although Howard Gerso was starting to recover, he was on therapeutic feeding, uh, they didn't know if he was going to survive because he had had such a severe shock. Uh, and I kept uh, then, you know, thinking about it. So I wrote my story, I leave, but that, that kept with me. This disease in my soul propelled me then to keep writing about this issue. I kept thinking, well, what, what's become of him? Uh, so in essence, looking into those eyes, this disease of the soul, the instance of, of, of this father and son and all the others in that situation in Ethiopia at the time, then has propelled me then to continue to write about this, to eventually leave the Wall Street Journal, to join the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, which I am now, which allows me to write these books. And so now I've written, this is the third book, that I've done all about the general topic of hunger and malnutrition in the 21st century, and the, 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 the absurdity and the shame and the obscenity that we still have. So what can we do about it? And, and, and what are the, the, the prospects of, uh, of, of finally conquering uh, this, this scourge that we have, have with us still in 2018? It causes a great impact to hear that story, right? Because the conditions that Ethiopia has um, were really are the worst. Mm -hmm. um, it's also interesting that um, you segmented the book in four countries. None of those is Ethiopia, right. but Guatemala is included there. What right. led you to include Guatemala in the, in the study? Right, so uh, great question. So in the book, so the first thousand days, so what I was seeing already at that time with, with Hargirso, because as I was getting the story from his father, he was telling me about basically from the time of his birth uh, that he was 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 a, a, an underweight uh, child. The mother during pregnancy uh, was was you know kind of sickly and weak. Um, uh, his first thousand day period, you know, say up until he was two years old, uh, he is a farmer. They were having you know problems with their with their crops and fields and things, so enough to feed the child. Uh, and then he was at the youngest when the famine hit, so he was the most vulnerable. So even though he was five. He had gotten off to such a lousy start in life nutritionally. So I'd been thinking of all that time, well, what, what becomes of these children then when they're uh, uh, malnourished uh, and then stunted in, in this first critical thousand day period? Um, and then as this, you know, I, I then our gears went to Ethiopia as part of the first book. So enough why the world's poor, starving in age of plenty. Uh, the second book where I followed smallholder farmers then in Western Kenya through the course of the years, they went into this period of profound deprivation of the hunger season, while they're, they run out of food while they're waiting for the next harvest to come in. And some malnourished children in those families. So I kept thinking of that, and then as I finished that book, and then was looking, yeah, is there another book that I can do about this? That's when this first thousand days movement and the importance of nutrition in this period, so the thousand days 
from the beginning of a mom's pregnancy, so from the time of conception, to the second birthday of the child. And why that's such a critical point for good nutrition? Uh, because it's nutrition, the vitamins, the minerals, uh, everything that's, that, that's, that's important for the healthy development of the, 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 the foundation for the physical growth of the child, to strengthen the immune system throughout life uh, of this child, and the cognitive development and the development of the brain at that time. Uh, is so important because the brain is growing most rapidly and expansively in this thousand day period. And that's all fueled by good nutrition and everything that supports it. So the water, the sanitation, the hygiene, uh, the, the, the infrastructure, the general health care system. Uh, and so I figured, well, how am I going to tell that story the first thousand days from a very um, uh, people-oriented, uh, personal standpoint? Not my personal standpoint, but the people who are afflicted and affected by this and the countries and societies that as a whole. And so I selected the countries, so it's India, Uganda, Guatemala, and then Chicago in the United States. And India because they have, in absolute numbers, they're such a big country and, and, and a huge population, in absolute numbers, they have like the most, the highest number of, of malnourished children uh, uh, are in, are in uh, uh, India. You know, not the highest percentage necessarily, but, but in total number. And then, so that was India. So any progress that's going to be made on this, India is really important because of the numbers. If we move the numbers down there and reduce malnutrition and stuff in there, then we can start seeing progress on the global setting. Uh, uh, Uganda, because Africa is important in this whole uh, setting, and, and particularly the importance of, uh, of, of agriculture and, and, and properly nourished crops. And I wanted to then also then focus on uh, a country in Central America. And I started then hearing about uh, uh, you know, uh, Guatemala or looking at the statistics of the stunting rates overall in Guatemala and childhood malnutrition, maybe one of every two children mm -hmm. in the country. And then had met people that were working in the Western Highlands on a nutrition uh, program in, in the Chela area. And they were saying, oh, there's like 70% of childhood malnutrition and stunting. And that's the worst in the Western Hemisphere um, in terms of the statistics in Guatemala. So I figured, oh, I should go to Guatemala. Uh, and, and, and then Chicago, to make the point, uh, particularly for readers in the United States, that look, this isn't a problem, it's just over there somewhere in these countries. It's also so critical to us in the United States uh, to get on top of this matter because we may not have you know stunting in terms of a physical uh, uh, condition that much in the United States but it's manifested almost in the opposite sense in kind of childhood obesity uh, and overweight already. There are rising numbers of, of, of uh, diabetes. The, of the, the, of the amount of the percentages of anemia for, for moms, uh, for children uh, is, is high. Uh, and rising uh, in the United States. So for all of these reasons, it was important then also to focus on uh, the U.S. But Guatemala then to also make the point that, that look, there's this a country that is battling uh, this, this, this uh, severe problem of childhood malnutrition and stunting, and it's, what, a uh, three-hour flight or so from Houston, yeah. from Miami? Even shorter than half an hour. Exactly. So that close to American borders, what's happening here? Uh, you know, we see you know the United States aware then of, of, of the migration issues, um, and that then the setting uh, in Guatemala and other places in Central America, um, you know, looking for a better life for for their children on the, the, the food front, on the nutrition. Uh, front. And so, quite a lot of it's a really important country for Americans uh, to understand. Thank you very much for sharing those experiences. We're, have, we're going to go to our first cut. Eh, amigos, les invitamos a que no se despeguen. Antes, le vamos a invitar a que nos sigan en nuestras distintas redes sociales, que nos sigan en el canal de YouTube de Cezanne y que nos visiten nuestras páginas web www.cezanne.gov.gt y www.cezanne.gov.gt En un momento regresamos con más Cezanne Televisión. El día de hoy estamos entrevistando a Roger Thoreau, autor del libro Los Primeros Mil Días. Ya regresamos. Toda la información generada por el Sistema Nacional de Seguridad Alimentaria y Nutricional la puede encontrar en nuestras redes sociales. 
Facebook, Twitter, YouTube e Instagram y en el www.sinsan.gov.gt y www.cesan.gov.gt. Cesan Radio es un programa que le permite conocer a profundidad temas de seguridad alimentaria y nutricional en voz de los expertos. Sintonícelo todos los martes de 14.30 a 15 horas a través de Radio Nacional TGW 107.3 FM. Cesan Radio, informándole para que se una a la lucha por erradicar la desnutrición infantil. Le invitamos a visitar nuestra página web www.cesan.gov.gt, donde podrá acceder a información de actividades, documentos, presentaciones y material educativo sobre seguridad alimentaria y nutricional, además de conocer todas las acciones que se llevan a cabo en el país. Gracias amigos, bienvenidos una vez más a su programa Cesan Televisión. Estamos entrevistando el día de hoy a Robert Thurow, él es el autor del libro Los Primeros Mil Días, un momento crucial para las madres y los niños y el mundo. En el primer bloque platicamos acerca de la inclusión de Guatemala dentro de los países estudiados para este libro y en este segundo bloque vamos a profundizar un poco más acerca de los resultados obtenidos y de la información que este estudio ha arrojado. Uh, Mr. Thurow, we were talking in the first block about um, why was Guatemala included in this study. Parting from there, um, it's interesting that the delivery moment is taken as one more step in the thousand window, in the thousand days window. Mm -hmm. um, what is so important about delivery that it has to be taken like with so, so much importance? Right, so that's why I devote like a, a section of the book or a chapter uh, to it. I was going to say, uh, just to add to the why Guatemala, the importance of it, you know, Research that's been being done at uh, at INCAP, mm -hmm. uh, the Institute for Nutrition of uh, Central, Central America and Panama, uh, has been really fundamental for people understanding the importance of the thousand day window. This research that started in like the late 60s and early 70s, and following you know the comparisons between children that were uh, receiving proper nutrients and those that weren't, and, and the moms uh, during the pregnancy and breastfeeding period, uh, that study that continues now with that same cohort has been so valuable in learning the impact of uh, poor nutrition and malnutrition in that in that period. So to be able to bring that in and say this, a lot of this knowledge that we have and why we need to focus on this in nutrition is coming from the study in, in Guatemala. So I think what that study finds uh, and, and the continuing nature of that, and as I was seeing in each of these countries, uh, that each of these, these these phases in the thousand days or periods in the thousand days, uh, so during the pregnancy of the mother, uh, then delivery, the, the, the breastfeeding of the mom, so the, the, the days and months uh, after delivery and then, and then the two years up to the second birthday of the child, they're all really important, but why I included uh, delivery uh, period is that the conditions vary so widely uh, in terms of uh, just kind of the general healthcare structure and system in which the child, in which uh, the, the birth happens. That can so then greatly influence uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the start in life that the child gets. And so while we're, we're, we're it, it, it's, it's really important and focus on while the mom is, is pregnant, that she has good nutrition. Uh, because then everything that she's eating then is being obviously passed on to the child. And already, you know, during pregnancy, the child may already recognize I'm being born into a world of scarce resources because the baby is, is, is already getting the, the, the message in the room that there's a nutrient deficiency from the food that the mom has. So that's why that time frame is so important. But all that can be undermined. So all the good nutrition and all the good efforts of the mom during uh, uh, pregnancy can then be undermined by just the infrastructure of the clinic or the hospital or at home uh, where she gives birth. And so we found that you know in, in a number of places. I mean, Guatemala in the hospital in, in Arechela uh, was making uh, uh, putting an emphasis on it was, there's been a kind of an international uh, movement for uh, baby friendly hospitals. And what that is, is basically putting that birth experience kind of at the center of, of, what, they, of what they do, uh, both for the health of the mother and then for the, for the baby, and then for breastfeeding and the care of the child uh, uh, 
uh, immediately afterwards. That was really impressive to see kind of the return of the war uh, and the delivery in, uh, in Shayla. And that the infrastructure there was, was, was uh, really focused um, on that. But what you would see in, in, in India uh, and Uganda, uh, that, you know, for those moms, there weren't even like uh, uh, the ultrasounds available to see the condition of the child at time of birth or shortly before birth. Uh, uh, to check the condition uh, of the mother. Uh, there was an instance in uh, Uganda that's described uh, in the book where you know, the mom, she, wasn't, she was feeling unwell the, the last several weeks uh, before giving birth. And you know, the doctors, they, they weren't doing a, an ultrasound uh, of her. They had the machine, but the power wasn't working and then it cost too much. And the mom says, nah, I, I can't afford it. And the nurses were saying, I think everything is okay because they were listening. Uh, kind of with 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 the with an old system, um, and they figure, oh yeah, we can we can hear a heartbeat, uh, so it seems to be. So you know, just just rest, uh, and then the day of birth comes, and the first the the, the the child is delivered, a little bit underweight, uh, so smallish, but alive, but alive, and then all of a sudden the doctors and the nurses say, wait a minute, there's another one. They had no idea that she was pregnant. The mom didn't know. The nurses during the prenatal checkups didn't know because just in the, 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 the infrastructure of the conditions at that hospital and the clinic weren't even available to check that. And so the second one then was born and was, was already dead at, at the time of uh, birth. She named the first child, uh, what means in their local language, the first of two girls. And then the second one would have been the second of, of two girls. Um, so there's one of the twins that then dies uh, at delivery because they didn't know the condition, or maybe that stress of the child was causing the 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 the, the mom feeling uh, unwell, uh, you know. And in uh, 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 India, you know, one of the moms, Shyam Kali, she gives birth sitting on the floor in in the clinic because they just had they had one one bed. Uh, or table for, for the delivery. They had another one for other moms that were coming in that were about to deliver. And so by the time she arrived, uh, both were occupied, so she just sat on the floor, you know, on a stained uh, blanket, on a very barren floor. There was one light bulb that was kind of dangling from the ceiling. Uh, there was, 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 was kind of no emergency equipment or anything there. And she just gave birth of the, of the child uh, on the floor. It was her fifth child. Uh, and so you just so that's why I wanted to include that the conditions around which you know the children are born and, and even in Chicago so the births were fine uh, uh, and, and so for mother and, and child there are a, a bit of complications with one of the moms but one of the other moms in Chicago uh, she wanted to to breastfeed uh, the child right away uh, but there was no assistance from the nurses or anybody she kept pressing the button to see if somebody would come and kind of help her at, at, the, at the initial uh, uh, attempts at breastfeeding, and nobody came. So then it was that it was resorted to bottle feeding, and she then was, was, was uh, uh, kind of rueful of that time and that moment that she didn't have uh, to begin breastfeeding uh, with her child. Uh, so that's why that point of delivery, uh, the, 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 the hours before, the hours after, then are so critical. So that's why I wanted to describe uh, that all these nutrition efforts and things during the mom's pregnancy can be nullified just by kind of unsanitary conditions, unhelpful, uh, unhealthy conditions, uh, the, 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 the nursing staff not paying attention or something in that moment of birth. And these are very important facts that most people do not take in consideration, right? And they mm -hmm. should be. But right. that's talking about the labor moment, but can you tell us what important facts did you find in this study and you're writing your book about first and second year, which are the culmination of the, right. of the thousand day window? Yep, exactly. And, and so that period, uh, so that breastfeeding is, is, is really uh, important and critical. Uh, I mean, there's no better food, and, and, and these are, are medical studies and academic and scientific reports for decades that have been you know, following this, uh, that, that kind of the nutrients and the vitamins and minerals and everything that the, that the baby needs uh, right away after birth and for the first you know, number of months, there's nothing better than the mother's milk. And so the emphasis on, on, on that, and there, you know, globally you find wide disparities, um, you know, in terms of breastfeeding rates, and particularly in the United States, it's very, it, it's low compared to kind of global 
uh, uh, comparisons. And I think so in, in, in Guatemala at the, at the hospital or the clinics where the moms in, in, in Chela then were giving birth, there was a big emphasis on it. There had been a lot of education beforehand. Uh, the moms uh, then on International Breastfeeding Day, World Breastfeeding Day, they kind of had a, a, a parade and a march in, 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 in the areas around uh, in, in the Palahuno Valley uh, with banners and balloons and things saying, here's the importance of, of breastfeeding so the children get off to the best possible uh, start in life. And then when the children uh, begin uh, uh, eating complementary foods, why, why that's so important. And so the cooking classes at that time, just here's, here's, here's the, the, the fruits, the vegetables, the meats uh, that, are, that, are, that are important, that contain these nutrients, uh, you know, uh, to focus on them, uh, both for the mother and then for the child after, after birth. And so you see that kind of then in the next uh, couple of years, the breastfeeding for the first six months, you know, longer, uh, if possible, and then what's the complementary feeding and then how you bring that all together. So in the, in, in the sections on Guatemala, I actually uh, uh, quote a couple of songs uh, from, uh, I think it's Internaciones uh, Conejo, mm -hmm. the International Rabbits, uh, the, the band, the marimba band, because uh, they had a song on, on, on the importance of breastfeeding and then on complementary feeding. And so, and their lyrics are really good. So the lyrics are in the are in the books from these two, yeah, from these I read two songs. You, you, right. You took in consideration about two or three songs, three songs, right? Yep, exactly. So that's a great way for messaging, right? Very popular band. People are listening to it all over. Wow, these guys are singing about this, or this band is singing about the importance of breastfeeding and complementary feeding. That's something as a family, mother, father, you know, grandparents, you know, to all to all learn about this. And so. Um, yeah, so some interesting things in Guatemala that's mm -hmm. happening on that front to, to really say this period is really important for uh, not only for the child and the family, but for our whole for our whole country. Because if one of every two children in Guatemala, then you know seventy percent or so in, in, in certain areas of the country, uh, that has a huge impact on not, sure. not only those individuals and families, but on the country as a whole mm -hmm. and on the, and on the economy. Is that productivity rate? Productivity. Yep. The, the, the educated the, 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 the education of the workforce the productivity of the workforce uh, the healthcare expenses uh, of, of that that these children have uh, you know because what I found in the book is that stunting is it's this life sense I was talking about of, of underachievement and underperformance and that's what the child carries throughout life so a stunted child becomes a stunted adult and and those impacts then is not just a moment in time or not just in a thousand days window but that is born by the individual, the family, the community, society as a whole, and the country as a whole, the world as a whole, through that, you know, through a child's life, through, through a person's life. Thank you very much for all this va really valuable information that probably most of the audience didn't know, now they do, and I think it's a very good, it's very good learning from you. Um, we're going to give you the last minute so you can send a message to our audience. Thank you. Um, Time is yours. Thank you. I, I think what I, I'd really like uh, people to understand is the, the, the impact and the devastation that childhood malnutrition and stunting cause, uh, kind of an aggregate, and, and what that all means. And yeah, it, as we were talking about the impact on the individual and the family, so the climb out of poverty is that much steeper if there's malnourished and stunted children. But then there's the impact, as we were just talking about, on, 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 on the labor force, on the productivity of a community, of a society, of a country. There's the lost economic impact. Uh, and then, you know, that a stunted child, we need to recognize that a stunted child anywhere, whether it's in India, Uganda, Guatemala, uh, Chicago, uh, a stunted child anywhere becomes a stunted child everywhere because we all, as, a, as, as global citizens, share in the cost. The World Bank estimates uh, that the annual cost, cumulative cost of childhood malnutrition and stunting is about three and a half trillion dollars a year, trillion with a T. That's an enormous sum of lost economic activity. So these are huge numbers. But I think the, 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 the greatest cost of, of, of childhood malnutrition and stunting is immeasurable in the sense that you think of what might a child have accomplished for themselves, for the family, for the, for the country, for all of us in this world, were they not stunted? Because stunting is this life sentence of, of, of underperformance and, and, and uh, of productivity, as I mentioned. So what one's looking at is, you have to wonder, a, a poem not written or, or a song not sung or a, a novel 
not imagined, uh, a gadget not invented, uh, a new horizon not explored, uh, a cure not discovered. And so again, you wonder what might a child have accomplished for all of us were they not stunted? And you realize that this lost chance of greatness for one child becomes this lost chance for us all. So we all share in this um, in this in this impact. So a stunted child anywhere in the world becomes a stunted child uh, everywhere uh, for us all. And that's the message that I really wanted to convey uh, in the book. That that we're all in this uh, together, and it has to be this common uh, uh, response and is pushed by all of us to that common mission. Now, stop it now. Thank you very much for this level of information. Y muchas gracias a ustedes, amigos, por habernos acompañado una vez más. Hemos llegado al final de nuestro programa y queremos agradecerle a Roger Thorough, autor del libro Los Primeros Mil Días, un momento crucial para las madres, los niños y el mundo. No nos queremos despedir de ustedes sin antes recordarle que nos pueden seguir en nuestras distintas redes sociales, suscribirse a nuestro canal de YouTube y visitarnos en nuestras páginas web www.sinsan.gov.gt y www.sinsan.gov.gt. Hasta la próxima semana. Un